Looks like we have a crowd of at least around 100, so this is one of our bigger bigger crowds. I kind of expected we would. Uh, to start here, I want to introduce my mom, Mary Carter. She was under the weather a few days ago, but she still managed to make it in here, so that's great. Thanks. And my wife, Paulette Carter, is here. And then my cousins. I have family backups here. Uh, Bernie, Penny, Nat, and Joe. Thanks a lot for coming, as usual. Uh, to begin with, David Lemon wants to make a short statement for the uh, History Center. I don't want to make, make this announcement, but I was coerced into it. Um, uh, Jeremy Boshears, who, is, who has uh, sp spoken who was a program here about the uh, covered bridges of Monroe County, um, has written a book. And uh, on uh, Thursday, this week at 5.30 at the History Center, there will be a program. And books are available. I'll just, I'll just put these up here. And also, all of you garage sale fanatics, the garage sale of the Monroe County History Center is moving to Profile Parkway, which is the old GE building, right? I think so, too. It's right across from Upland Brewery, if you know you're out there. So I think that's all I had to say. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. Now, George wears two hats today. He's my minister of propaganda, but also he's a presenter today, so this is probably just going to be really tiring for him, but uh, here we go. You can do your usual spiel here. Thank you for the pleasure of your time coming today. I'm George Carpenter. I'm uh, vice president and membership director for the Monon Railroad Historical Society. And that's going to be a bit of a word about our sponsor, which is the Monon Society. We'll be talking more about that later. I'd like to thank you, uh, the, the Legion, for having us today. And particularly, I'd like to thank our servers. Please be generous with them, uh, because we don't want to have to serve ourselves. I'd like to present, ah, very good. I'd like to present my wife, Mary Ann who has suffered through 51 and a half years of being part of the Mona, and my number three grandson, Sebastian Carpenter, who is up here from Oklahoma and has recently enlisted in the Marine Corps. So, so. Yeah, uh, I know, John, that's what I had in mind, is have you talk to him. That's just what he needs. Okay, okay. Uh, before you leave, I have brochures about the Monon Railroad Society. I have a special deal. You know what's coming, Phil. I have a special deal. If you become a member today, you will get all of the 2019 publications and also get the next year is in at, uh, membership as well. That's a $100 deal for just 50 bucks. What do you, thank you. That's just the sort of help I need. Okay. Are you ready to begin this? All right. Let, let Mike get over and control the lights. Well, no, I got, I got two more. No, you're, you're done. <laughs> I just wanted to mention our next programs, and we're booked uh, through April of next year. Uh, August 27th, John Summerlot will give a program on IU and its military history. Uh, September 24th. This marks the bicentennial month of the First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington. And local historian Owen Johnson will present its history. Uh, October 15th, 2019. This is one of those bonus programs. There's five Tuesdays in October, like there was this month. So we're going to stick one in on October 15th. Brad Cook, curator of the IU Fo Photo Archives, 
will return to show more vintage photos and images of Bloomington. October 29th, Randy Richardson will give a program entitled Once Upon a Time in Monroe County. She does a lot of research on this stuff, and she has stories from our past. The earliest story is from 1857, and the latest is about a business that began in 1920s is still doing doing well. Uh, November 26th, uh, Derek Ritchie is writing a book, so now he wants to do a program. So, and it's actually really this is pretty cool. People will like this: the dark side of Monroe County, the mysteries, murders, and scandals that shock Bloomington. Uh, he'll relate six different things. The, the latest one's 1941, so I don't think he's going to make anybody mad that's still around. So, uh, December 17th, and we had to do December a little early because of, of Christmas. So Hillary Fleck of the History Center, who just gave a program a short time ago, will give a program on the women's suffrage movement in, Mon in Monroe County. 2020 will mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Uh, January 28th, local historian David Nord uh, will give a program entitled Power, Transport, and Machinery, the Revolution in Flour Milling in Indiana, including Monroe County, from 1820 to 1920. Uh, I just lined this one up the other day, coming up next. February 25th, 2020, local historian Duncan Campbell, who's spoken here a couple of times before, uh, We'll discuss local architect John Nichols, and I'll bet most of you don't know that name, John Nichols. He was a renowned architect that built many, many homes in Bloomington, a lot of the old mansions. And he's going to go over the photos of them and show the ones that are, some of them are still around, so I, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, March is open for right now, but probably not for too long. April 28th, 2020, Michael White and Adam Stilwell will give a presentation on the Origins and History of Local Cats TV. The people back here who record all these programs. Cats goes back about 45 years. And uh, the history of that should be very interesting. Uh, so now we get to the Monon Railroad. How many people here either worked for the Monon or had relatives on the Monon? Yeah, quite a few. I figured that. Uh, George gave this program almost exactly six years ago. And there must have been 20 people here when he did it. And we weren't re recorded for TV or anything. And it was, the, it was the first program we gave in this room. And it was the first PowerPoint that we gave. So that kind of set, George kind of set the, the direction for what we do with that one program. Uh, George, this is called the History of the Monon Railroad. He'll give a snapshot history of the railroad. The Monon occupied a very important place in the history of Bloomington. It literally opened up the outside world for our community. Uh, he'll cover the period of 1847 to 1972. Special emphasis will be given to Monroe County communities and people served by the railroad. This will be a multimedia presentation. George is one of the co-founders of our Monroe County History Club and is an expert on the Monon Railroad and all th things railroad, although he told me not to say that, but I did. George is also vice president and director of membership services with the Monon Society. So, here we go, George. Thank you very much for the pleasure of your company today. I really appreciate such a large crowd coming out to see all of us. And I'm going to have to stay seated. I, I don't stand up very well. But um, uh, if you have any questions along the way, please save them toward the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, so that way we can answer them all at one time. Oh, come on. <laughs> there we go. It's up and down the moon on. It's a brief history of the railroad with emphasis on Bloomington and Monroe County. This was originally created by Kenneth Weller, and I'm updating it today. My grandfather worked for the Monon. There was a passenger station for years in downtown Bloomington. I remember a guy known as Red. McDole Yard was in Bloomington. Do you remember? How many of you went to Bloomington High School? 
Do you remember those late summer days as we were beginning the school year when the windows were pulled all the way up to the top on the west side of the school, trying to get a breath of air through the school? And you'd hear in the distance the sound of a horn. And as it charged north, getting louder and louder and louder, and the teachers trying to struggle to give their lectures over it, and eventually they surrendered, and all heads would turn and look out that window to see that train pass. And just for a moment, just for a moment, you were on that train headed north. This program first is dedicated to the memory of Kenneth Weller. Ken created this program uh, about seven years ago. He created several of them for communities along the railroad, and he created one for Bloomington. Ken was particularly like he particularly liked Bloomington because he went to Indiana University School of Law, where he graduated. And while he was there, he became familiar with the railroad and fell in love with it. And when he moved to Lafayette and set up his practice there, uh, he continued his membership in the Monon Society as secretary and later vice president. This presentation is also dedicated to my great uncle, Lurley E. Fultz, engineer. If it wasn't for his persuading me to become interested in railroads, and giving me the interest in railroads and the passion particularly for the moment, we wouldn't be having this presentation today. But moreover, this presentation is given in honor of the men and women of the Mona who through their generations of service made Bloomington, Monroe County, and Indiana the place that it is today. Now we're going to start here at the very basics of transportation. From the very beginning, this was the first form of transportation. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to hoof it. Average walking speed is about 3.1 miles per hour. Walking speed is uh, affected by terrain, weather, physical condition of the walker. Admittedly, on land, you could use horses, mules, oxen to be able to pull a wagon. But the roads in Indiana in 1847 weren't that great. And yet it goes really bad in the springtime and really bad in the fall, impossible in the winter, and maybe passable in the summer. And then something happened to change all of history. The Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution changed everything. The first railroads were invented in England in the early 1800s. This is an example of George Stevenson's The Rocket. This moved transportation from 3.1 miles per hour to roughly 12 to 15 miles an hour. So the change of life changed immediately. This looks like a fun way to travel. <clears throat> I think it'd be fun to ride on there. First class passengers rode inside the stagecoach. Second class passengers rode up on top. You better have something to go along with you to put the fire out in your hat or your hair. <laughs> well, I think it'd be fun. I, don't know. No, I, mean, I wouldn't want to go from New Albany to Michigan City that way, but it'd be fun. The first American railroad was the Baltimore and Ohio. It was built in 18, to start in 1827. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold today, so I've had to stop every so often to clear my throat. Please excuse me. The first locomotive was Tom Thumb. This is a re reproduction of the locomotive, and it's currently at the Baltimore and Ohio Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it's quite an invention. The first Indiana Railroad was owned by the state of Indiana. It, went, it was planned from the from North Madison up to Indianapolis. It started in 1836.
The New Albany and Salem Railroad was chartered on July 7th, 1847. And it was an interesting thing. It was the parent of the Monon. It must be addressed at all aspects of the 1847 uh, railroad science and art was, uh, was very much in its infancy. Uh, everything was done quickly and as cheaply as possible. The only concern was to get the rails laid and have locomotives and cars roll to start making money. This is, I forgot to mention that there were other forms of transportation. Ships and steamships and river boats could far out carry just about any loads, but they were contingent on rivers or canals. This, uh, this particular railroad, the first locomotives that were brought to the New Albany and Salem were named after the principal towns of the route, New Albany, Providence, and Borden, or, or Salem. Uh, Providence was later renorm, renamed Salem. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, of course, it, uh, Providence was renamed uh, was renamed Borden. This is an example of what a locomotive would have looked like. The first locomotives in the New Albany and Salem were named for New Albany, Providence, and Salem. They were $7,500 each and were purchased from the Norris Brothers Locomotive Company of, of Pennsylvania. The first locomotive, New Albany, was delivered to, by steamboat to New Albany docks late in 1848. It was actually was brought clear around Florida, taken to New Orleans, unloaded off a, of a ship onto a steamboat, brought up the Mississippi River and the Ohio, and delivered there. Because there was no national railroad network to be able to connect everything together. This also is handled with the second, second locomotive the same way. This is an, also an example of, of this. This is what's called a 440 locomotive. And let's see, does this thing work? It did work. Yeah, thank you. The reason it's called a 440 locomotive is it has four pilot trucks, four pilot trucks, and four driver trucks. This was also called the American class locomotive. And if you look at any early American locomotive pictures, they're almost all 440s. This particular issue here was uh, one that was came along a little later because you can tell by the diamond stack. Now we're going to talk about the route. The original route of the railroad was scheduled to be from New Albany and Salem. It was 35 miles long and was completed in January of 1851. Now let me say a word about railroads of the era. Surveys were done first to plot the best route. Multiple surveys were made to, to, to go along. And factors to concern, uh, consider were grade, availability of water, wood, structures to be built, population, industrial, and agricultural potential. The land was acquired by purchase, donation, or by eminent domain. I'm going to take a minute to talk about eminent domain here. The Monon was 
after they developed the trek to, make, to Salem, they were given what is virtually called a roving charter that the state government said, you can go anywhere you want and do anything you want, and whoever gets in your way has to sell you the land. So that was called the original land grant railroad that came through at that point. And this shows, how as well as it show up? Shows the state of Indiana, and it shows here. I'm going to circle in on this. That was that was the original route of the of the New Albany and Salem, and it was fabulous because the merchants uh, in New Albany thought they were going to be able to get their goods up to Salem and the farmers in Salem thought they were going to be able to haul their produce down to the Ohio River and in that the Monon was built exactly backwards because the grade from Salem to New Albany went downhill so the farmers thought that was great, but it turned out to be a real pain for the, re for the railroad for the rest of the history because coming through that first grade through the Floyd Knobs was tough. Above all, getting the rails late, no matter how slipshod, and get the, start, get the cash started flowing. Uh, to give you an example, the elevation at Salem was 751 feet and at New Albany was 449 feet. And the sense of urgency to, for why it was quick will become clear in 1857. The railroad was completed to Bedford in eight, April 18, 1853. Now I need to say, take a word here. James Brooks was the first president of the New Albany and Salem. And he had it in his mind from the very beginning, not just to stop at Salem. And he convinced the state legislature that a railroad was needed to run from New Albany on the Ohio River all the way to Lake Michigan. And the point selected on Lake Michigan was Michigan City. They completed the rails to Bedford on April 18, 1853. This date, October 11th, 1853, should be still be celebrated in the, the town of Bloomington today. It was the day the first, Monon, the first, first railroad train arrived in downtown Bloomington. And it was very important. The railroad continued on through Gosport for the rest of the year and was eventually went on to Michigan City. <coughs> this shows an, an early map of Bloomington showing in red the route of the, of the railroad through town. And this shows the map of the, Ohio, uh, of the Ohio and the Lake United. The first train ran from Michigan City to New Albany on July 3rd, 1854, a total of 287 miles. After the first trains were completed, the first three locomotives, they ordered five more from Norris Locomotive Company, and they were shipped in through the Great Lakes. So the first train made his trip all the way from Michigan City to New Albany. He uh, took off about uh, 5 o'clock in the morning and arrived about 9 p.m. that night all the way. It was a record time from the top of the start. I want to point out here, too, that the Railroad is a north-south railroad, and that be will become very critical later because most of the other railroads coming across the country were east-west railroads. And the Monon, being the senior railroad, it was here first, the first pioneer railroad, had seniority over all these other uh, the railroads. So whenever stations were built or, or contact points were made junctions, the Monon had seniority of going across there. Aiming at Michigan City turned out to be a mistake. It never became an important port on the Great Lakes. 
Chicago would have been a better choice. And this is a picture of the depot in later years at Michigan City. It's since been torn down. Here's an 1858 map of Monroe County. Uh, you notice to the right, a red line that goes up through here and joins up here. And the blue line is actually the run of Clare Creek. Clare Creek has a very intimate relationship with the Monon over the years. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, the depot at Harrodsburg does not run through the town. It's about a mile away. And that may have affected the uh, growth of the town over the years. This was terrible. The Mona had, uh, the railroad had a 2.7 grade from Harrodsburg to Smithville. It was the steepest on the railroad. And I want to make one correction here. If you hear me say Monon, it should, it should be interchangeable with any of the precedent residents. Right now, I'm talking about the New Albany and Salem. This is the depot, original depot at New Albany. They had to drag the first locomotives across the docks and through town to be able to be put on the rails there. A little review here. The railroad was founded by James Brook in 1847. It was built north from New Albany and built south from Michigan City. The town of Brookston is named for James Brooks. Francisville is named for his daughter. <coughs> the section between Lafayette and Crawfordsville was brought, bought from another short line railroad. Now to concentrate more on Monroe County. Bloomington, from the very beginning, was designated to be a divisional headquarters. And what does a divisional headquarters mean? Well, it means that you were to have a permanent station, you were to have an engine t uh, repair facility, a turntable, a roundhouse, a freight station, and all the things necessary to be able to support the railroad. And this, this is a very old Sanborn map. This is 1883. <coughs> there it is. That shows the station right there. But this is what's even more important. The engine facilities were in beautiful downtown Bloomington, right at the corner of Kirkwood and Morton. And if you can imagine dozens of trains a day running in and out through downtown Bloomington uh, with all their smoke and all the hubbub and everything like that, everything that went with the railroad, it was quite a show. The, the town, of the, the city of Bloomington really was glad to see the railroad get out of town, get out of get out of downtown. This particular map shows the path of the Monon going north in black, and it shows the other, no, an east-west railroad going through at, uh, at Bedford. In 1857, there was a, a, a panic that hit the banking industry. And all bank, all panics always impacted the railroad in a, in a terrible way. So the New Albany and Salem were, went bankrupt, and they were reorganized as the, New, uh, as the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago. So Salem was complete, cut completely out of the, out of the name of the railroad. The Monon was very busy during the Civil War. As I mentioned before, it was a north-south railroad connecting to and around northern Indiana and Chicago. So they were able to bring truth, troops up and down the railroad all the time. Austin Seward had a foundry on the west side, on Bloomington and the west side. 
and he did uh, make cannonballs and cannons for the Union Army. The New Albany and uh, the New uh, the railroad did have a part in uh, Abraham Lincoln's funeral. The Lincoln funeral train came in to Lafayette and went to Michigan City, where it was under this large facility here, this arbor. Uh, the train moved at a st ordered five miles an hour and took 16 days to be able to make the, the, the uh, complete trip. The New Albany and Salem became the uh, Louisville, New Albany and Chicago, and it operated between 1859, when it came out of receivership, to 1897. It then became, in 1897, became the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville. And it was known as the Monon Route because the, it crossed at the town of Monon. I need to say a word about Sanborn maps. This is one of the most proficient tools that you can have studying the history of a town. Indiana University is blessed to be the repository of the entire country's worth of Sanborn maps, going back from the mid-1880s uh, clear up until the present day, although not all of those are available after 1923 for you to see yet. But uh, this particular map shows the depot. I'm going to go zoom in on that. The depot downtown. Once again, you've got the engine facility. Here. And the depot is down here. Now, this depot is interesting because it's a run-through depot. Now... You'll find out a lot of things in railroad history, the railroads burned their stuff down. And you'd think that having a run-through depot wouldn't be such a good idea. But as it, as it turned out, the, the run-through portion of it wasn't for passengers to be able to get on the train uh, in, out of the rain. It was to keep the freight safe so that they could be unloaded to the uh, carriers in the town and reloaded when they brought freight to go out. seen that. This is an 1888 map showing the, the uh, path of the railroad through the, through the, through the county. <coughs> These are examples of paperwork that are part of the Monon collection. Uh, some things that happened along this line was, as this is outside of Monroe County, uh, the Indianapolis airline was a cloud, uh, a, a acquired in 1881. It was extended to French Lick Resort area in 1887. They bought the Bedford and Bloomfield narrow gauge line and then standard gauged it. They also bought the Indianapolis and Louisville coal branch, which went down toward Linton, and brought bought the Chicago and Wabash Valley, otherwise known as the Onion Line, in 1914. This is a board of directors tour. Now, I want you to get a look at this group of august gentlemen that sat up here on the bleachers. Yeah, imagine some, something the word the idea of bugs in the, your teeth come to the mind, but uh, I don't feel too bad for them. Uh, let's take a couple of look at Bloomington highlights here in the background is the Bose Hotel. And they built up these bleachers. They took the side out of a boxcar or something and built the bleachers. And down here on the ground, you got the working crew, the conductor, and then the head trainman, engineer, and fireman. Up there on the, up there on the platform, this man right here is William H. McDowell. He was the first, first president, or he was the uh, president of the Monon during the second receivership. 
And I think the picture would show that this was taken right about right here on the track. That shows the rip up a little, little bit crows closer up. This next one is an 1898 photo bomber. <laughs> he got into the picture. Um, he has no idea what he's doing there, but to this day, he's remembered. 1896 became a time of great change for the Monon. Started adding new locomotives. And the geologists say that the in the state, our limestone industry, there's no better in the world. So the Monon started, started buying bigger locomotives. <clears throat> this is taken from the Blur Bloomington Courier in June of 1898. It talks about the new locomotives that are going to come, weighing 16,000 pounds, or 76,000 pounds. 76, 176,000 pounds. I'm having a great time. Are you all doing all right? <laughs> that makes me feel better. All right. This is President William H. McDowell. He was a trendsetter in railroads in the late 1800s. He started with the, the railroad as a telegraph clerk and worked his way up to presidency. Everything that you hear down in Southern Bloomington, it says McDowell, is associated with this man right here. Uh, I personally feel that the, what they're calling Switchyard Park should be named William McDowell Park. This particular map shows, once again, shows Clear Creek, but it also shows the additional route that was pulled in called the Stone Belt Railroad. Now I need to go back a minute. I mentioned the grade at Smithville being 2.27%. That means they had to break the trains at Harrodsburg, pull half or part of the train up the grade, park it at Smithville, and then go back down and pick up the other part of the train and drag it up and then go on into Bloomington from there, hook, together, hook them back together. The Stone Belt Railroad followed the water level route of Clear Creek. And the reason they didn't bend, build it in the first place, which would have been a really an advantageous way to handle it, was because they would have had to cl cross Clear Creek 14 times. Now, uh, water level routes uh, tend to make railroads run a lot smoother. But as I said before, the idea originally was to get the railroad laid out and, and get, get the money flowing in. This shows a grade map. We really can't see all of it. But there's the original main line from 1853, and this is the stone belt and belt line down through here. This, this particular thing shows the, shows the horrendous grade that starts up right there from Smith, from Harrodsburg all the way up through here. And it's, there's Smithville at that point right there. And you'll see why it becomes an advantage in a few minutes, how somebody took advantage of that grade for their own uh, betterment. Why did they call it the Monon? Well, if you'll notice, as the line was completed, they did eventually get into Chicago, and they also got a line down to Indianapolis. But the town of Monon is where the railroad crossed, where all four branches of it went in. Monon means swift running in Potomotomy. And I read that out of a book, so I don't have any idea what Monon really means, but uh, uh, we'll take it, leave it at that for now. When the Monon reached Chicago, they were, went, to the, went to Dearborn Station. Uh, that was the northern terminus of the railroad. 
the Monon and all the railroads before that were all within the state of Indiana. Also Indianapolis Union Depot and Louisville's Union Station. Now we're going to talk about the communities along the in Monroe County. Start with Bloomington. The first Bloomington station may have looked something like this. This is Gosport. Or it could look something like this. This is Bedford. They were both brick permanent, permanent facilities and it burned to the ground in 1857. And if you have a picture somewhere hidden away of the original Bloomington station, please let us know because we'd like to be able to see what it looked like. This shows a map of, down, of downtown Bloomington in 1887 and once again shows that the engine facility and station and freight facilities were right in the middle of town. We don't have, there's only one picture I've ever seen that even relates to this and it's in the Monroe County Library in the Indiana room. It's on a wall, it's a picture, it's a panorama of different shots taken from the old courthouse and you can see the old, you can see the second station there. This is a representation of what the Bloomington station looked like in 1905. You notice they don't have a run through anymore on that station. Uh, a lot of people were coming and going there. This is a probably a this is a southbound train. Uh, this shows another shot. This is when the students were getting ready to leave Bloomington in June. In the background, you can see the Methodist Church, the steeple for it. And this is the third shot of the depot. It had a nice flower garden out there in the middle of the parking area. This is a combination shot that I've put together uh, for the to show the the closeness of however where the where the town the city hall was or the county courthouse was down to the station. Around 1910, the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railroad decided that they needed new depots. The one that was at, it was at Bloomington had existed since 1857, and they decided to tear it down and put in a new, more modern depot. This was a proposed drawing for, for that uh, depot. We're looking here from the southeast, looking northwest. And one of the interesting features are the bird's eye windows that are above it, which kind of is a hallmark of this particular depot. This is an interesting picture from the standpoint of looking from the buildings that were on over on uh, to the east of the depot. What is that? Gentry Street. You can see the Quaker Oats sign that was the advertisement on the back of the building. This is Bloomington Depot looking south from the, from the northeast. In the background you can see the gas tank for the Indiana Gas Company. In 1913 things changed. Uh, they uh, built a freight depot, but you notice that the round the turntable and engine facilities are now gone, but the tracks are still running across 5th Street. You notice there are five tracks going across 5th Street at this point. Monon was quite busy during World War I. There's an interesting thing about World War I is that all the railroads were rubbing their hands together thinking they were going to make a bunch of money and Woodrow Wilson nationalized all the railroads. So they, they didn't do what they thought they were going to do. They were basically taken away from, the power was taken away from the railroads to be able to run their own, run their own business. Uh, here's this, the D Bloomington Depot uh, looking north and you may notice some of the older buildings. Smith Holden, right, thank you. This is an early view of Harrodsburg looking north. 
Harrodsburg was originally called New Jean or New Jane. Well, what happened here? You know, they talk about the best laid plans of mice and men. That, that, was, that was only true with computers. This is Harrodsburg. Harrodsburg was originally known as New Jane or New Jean, and uh, was uh, planted in 1836. As I said before, the town of Harrodsburg was to the west of the, of the depot by about a mile. Uh, you'll notice here the water tank and the bridge that crosses over Clear Creek. Here's a later shot of the same position. This was taken probably early 1920s. And here's a, here's a shot looking south at the same thing, at the same place in, in Harrodsburg. This is Ketchum's. Now, Ketchum's was, is an interesting place because it was basically a flag stop. It was over on the Stone Belt Railroad, and it was built specifically for, to transport the Ketchum family from their house down in southwestern Monroe County to Bloomington and back and forth. And any time they wanted to pick up a train, they would hang a, hang a flag out, and the train would stop and take them. I think it's pretty handy. <laughs> this is Smithville. Smithville was planted in 1851 as the railroad came to town. It was a neat place to have a railroad because all the trains broke there. The Smithville station was actually owned by the man who planted the town, George Smith. And the trains had to stop there to go back and pick up the other part of the train. And he had an ideal opportunity for a captive audience to be able to go in and uh, shop in his store. He had a, a general goods store there. Oh, God. What does it do that? OK. This is a reasonably important photo. This represents Sanders. There was no depot at Sanders, uh, but it was kind of important here because of one guy that's in this photo. This man right here is Dan Green. Is Dan Green. Dan Green is Janie Shields' five coats for grandfather. We're going to see more pictures of, of Modon employees in just a few minutes. Railroad also ran through Clear Creek. This is a later shot of Clear Creek at milepost mile 224.2. This is looking from the road that crossed right in front of the station. Now we come to Ellettsville. Anybody here from Ellettsville? Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. This was the first station in Ellettsville. And one night they pulled a train in there. It was full of matches. They had a boxcar load of matches. Somehow or another, of course, the train caught on fire. The train then, the boxcar then proceeded to burn down the Ellettsville station. And the Monon says, well, we really wanted to move the station into, closer into downtown Ellettsville, closer for the people. So we want this land. Well, they didn't have the eminent domain portion anymore. So Ellettsville says, we'd like to sell it to you, but we want so much money. And the Monon says, no, we don't want to pay that much money. 
So they said, okay, we'll just take care of this. So they moved an old raggedy boxcar in and put it up on the cross ties and used that as a station where this one burned down. Well, the people of Ellsville didn't like that. So they burned the boxcar down. So the Monon said, well, okay, we'll fix that. We've got some land out north of Ellettsville, about, about a mile. And we're going to build the new station there. And the people of Ellettsville said, well, that's a long way to have to walk to get to a railroad station. And the Monon says, yeah. So the Ellets people of Ellettsville got together and they decided to give the moan on what they wanted. So they moved the station down, the, down toward downtown Ellettsville. And this was the final station. So the, the station at Ellettsville, they had two different stations in three different locations. And this was a, the final shot of, of the station before it was torn down in the, the 70s. This is Steinsville. Steinsville was a hardworking town on the Stone Belt and made its fortune by handling, uh, by handling stone. But it was also a, a place to stop to be able to pick up the train. You could go everywhere on a train until the 1940s. You could get on a train and go absolutely anywhere. This is a very rare look photo. This is a circa 1905 uh, photo taken of the second Bloomington Roundhouse. It was, the original the Roundhouse was moved to Hillside Avenue, or Hillside Street down uh, on, at where McDowell Yard is, was. And this is locomotive is parked outside the Roundhouse. And this is the only portion, portion partial picture we have of that Roundhouse. It burned down in 1907, as well as the telegraph office, which was over here. So there was a lot of facilities moved to south of Grimes Lane after 1900. And this shows the location of that roundhouse next to Hillside. It was called South Street at that point. I think David Lemon did a, a, ser a series on the history of different streets in Bloomington. Yeah. And that's the telegraph office. It burned down in 1907. It was interesting that he had moved the telegrapher's offices out of Bloomington to Lafayette at that point. Lafayette had become a major, major center on the railroad with uh, a huge shop facility built up there. They could pick up entire locomotives and move them through the, through the shop. That shows, the X marks the spot about where that locomotive would have been taken, picture would have been taken. In 1913, a new lo uh, roundhouse was built. It was 18 stalls. And it was uh, a very important facility. This shows an early picture of what that roundhouse and yard would have looked like. And this shows them much later. This would have been a 1930s picture. You can see the locomotives in the roundhouse. Yeah. Another picture of that. This is an interesting picture. You wouldn't know it, but it's all wrong. Actually, you're looking at the, the, to your left is the north end of the round, uh, north end of the building. That's the way it ought to look. And that happens a lot in in studying uh, history of different place, locations. Sometimes you'll pick up a picture and find out later that it was laid out wrong, and the people it was actually photographed like this. There were always a lot of boys around railroad tracks. That's where I kind of grew up. I was down in my deal. You'll notice that there are two windows on the north end of that uh, building. 
and there's one window on the south end. Now, we're starting to get into place here. We're talking about some people. Take a close look. Do you recognize any of those folks? Let me zoom in here. This was taken in 1927. This may, may be some fathers and grandfathers of some of you folks in there. This also was taken looking north up the railroad in the distance. Maybe you can make it out. Clear back here is the smokestack for Bloomington High School. Right back there. So that gives you some idea of when those trains were coming north out of McDowell Yards, charging up past the school, how far they had to go, and how close a relationship it was between our school and the railroad. This is a locomotive at the coaling station at McDowell. Now, I want to stop a second here. This is Monon Gold. This is a marvelous photograph because it tells everything you want to know about what's going on there. Who, what, where, when, and why. And you have left, left to right, Jack Sparks, Ezra Ray, who uh, worked for Ora Coots. He was the foreman on a section crew. And the, the flagman, Bob Daub, was there. And he was... carrying his stop sign in his right hand and a red flag in his left. And his job was to step out into the middle of the street and try to stop traffic before the train hit them. Now, there were a lot of railroad accidents that happened, and I don't no doubt why, but it was, it was certainly... Uh, so, and certainly what the flagman had to do. And when you got too old and lost enough fingers or whatever working on the railroad, they gave you a job as a shanty attendant, as a flagman, and every time a train came through town, you had to step out in front of all the traffic and stop the train because they didn't have automatic signals. Now, plug for a local university. This is locomotive number 445, circa 1920, decorated for the scrapping Hoosiers. And this train is parked right behind what is now the community center. Is that what it's called? The uh, convention center. It used to be Graham Motor Company. And this is another shot of the same thing. And I want you to pay particular attention to right up in here, in that doorway. This is the next shot of that. Notice the crewmen, the engineer and fireman, are dressed up in Indiana Railroad regalia. The uh, conductor and head brakeman didn't partake. But in that window, you'll notice people standing there. There's a little girl and a bunch of men. And that doorway it was a crane that came out over the tracks. And the railroad would bring Model T Fords to Graham Motor Company. They would be lifted on that crane and hauled into the second floor of Graham Motor Company, assembled there, and then rolled down the ramp those of you who remember Graham Motor Company know there's a ramp inside of it. Be rolled down the ramp into the showroom. Uh, of course, that other university had a, a locomotive, too. That was decorated up very nicely in, in, in black and gold. 
the Great Depression hit very, very hard on the railroad. Uh, people were laid off. Engines were retired, retired and scrapped. This is and this is pictures of Bloomington, 1934. This switch engines located here, getting ready to go to the scrapper. There were some trains running. This particular picture was taken in 1931, and we had an ice house down at Magnolia Yard. And the ice was used to put into refrigerator cars to be able to keep fruit. Uh, it could be where it could be transported across the nation, be able to keep fungible goods. Uh, from being uh, rotting out. They also used the ice to cool the passenger cars. They installed ice bunkers in the passenger cars so they could shut the windows. It was now completely air conditioned. You didn't have dirt and cinders and all that blowing in from the locomotives. And that was one of the selling points for the Monon. This is switcher number 39, and this happened in 1939, that he brought a load of iron firemen. How many of you ever had a stoker fired home? So you remember that before that, you had to have somebody had to put, put coal in the furnace at night, maybe get up in the middle of the night. Your, your stoker would be able to automatically across the course of the evening be able to put coal into your furnace. Now, show the stokers out on the platform at the freight station. And in the background you see the beautiful Bloomington Limestone Station. Now we're getting toward the end of the Depression. This, this is the problem, the Charles Huffer collection from the Monon Society. And there may be some people here you know. Uh, Messrs. Edding, Newton, Cornwall, Osborne, and Page. In the bottom row are Lindsay, Chambers, Lee, Trowbridge, Query, and Nevins. Any of those names make anything to anybody? Your grandfather? Newton? Blackie Newton. Oh, I remember Blackie Newton. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, Sturdivant was the yard clerk, and uh, Patterson was the yard master, and A.D. Fox was the uh, operator, telegraph operator. Uptown, you had uh, F.E. Tyndall and D.L. Crismore as the ticket agents. Now, the Monon had an absolutely important impact on the community economically. This picture was taken in the late 1940s, and it shows all the roundhouse workers, the management, standing on one of the locomotives. You got the brass standing down here. This is the bosses. But it was said that there were at one point over 2,000 men came out of McDowell Yards, worked every day in the roundhouse, in the yards, on the trains, moving from one place to another. Someone brought this picture today. This is the famous bridge over bridge over a creek at just south of the crossing at Clear Creek. Another Monon steam locomotive. For the third time in its history, the Monon had a divisionary president. This is John Walker Berger. And after World War II, the Monon was completely shot. After World War I, they, didn't, they got some new locomotives then. But through the Depression and through World War II, there was no new equipment was purchased. 
Berger used his influence with the Electromotives Division of Venn General Motors to purchase new diesel locomotives. And this particular locomotive set is set in the black and gold freight scheme. This is taken at the uh, assembly plant over in Illinois. That, uh, this locomotive set hadn't rolled a mile yet. The Monon also hired a promotional series of pictures by a famous railroad artist named Howard Fogg. And this is a kind of a fantasy drawing of what the railroad would look like down at uh, the yard office. This is also one that he made of the limestone industry. This is one of my favorites. So the kids still swimming on Clear Creek as this locomotive comes charging through. That's correct. Last name was Perry. I can't think this was taken from a black and white photograph that was given to Howard Falk. And there, this wasn't the only, this was the only print that was made of it. It was a watercolor. Uh, but the kids were swimming there. And there was also a, there, a woman or an older lady there with them. Uh, they were all swimming in the creek. And when that train came through and stopped there on that bridge, uh, that type of particular bridge is called a plate bridge. And it was one of the reasons they could do the Stone Belt Railroad, because they didn't have the technology before the 1890s to be able to put together the uh, uh, rail uh, bridges like that. And here's a set of locomotives crossing uh, in Purdue colors. In 1947 was the centennial founding of the New Albany and Salem. And you'll see some, some of the things up here on the table. I think some of that had to do with the, uh, the, this record set. Berger got together and had 12 different songs made up about the Monon. You heard the beginning, the, the up and down the Monon, just about everybody knows. The earth. So how many of you have never heard that song before? <laughs> well, have I got a treat for you. Uh, up and down the Monon, there were 12 different songs. One of them was like, The Gentleman Who Paid My Fare, uh, The Bell of the Monon, Who Was She, all of these songs. And the, 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 uh, the centennial started at... Michigan City and went all the way to New Albany and every one of the major towns along the way they would stop and uh, have a celebration until they finally got to New Albany and, this, and they had parades they had people marching in the street it was just absolutely awesome there might be some people here right now that were in that crowd 1947 Yeah, a lot of people there, weren't they? You couldn't get that many people out right now. <laughs> this is just kind of a railroad shot of train number 74 leaving Bloomington. See the Grand, the, the Bose Hotel was still in the background with the Graham Hotel at the same location. You can see our courthouse there. Passenger service. On the Indianapolis line, they had the, the Hoosier. One of the nice things about the Hoosier or the tip of canoe was that you could go down there uh, to the railroad yard at the station at 38th Street, where the fairground is, and go in, have a meal on a dining car, go to your berth on the Pullman car, and wake up the next morning in Chicago. 
So it was kind of a very handy business service to be able to do. This is kind of an awful picture of the to looking down at the top of the McDowell Yards, but this is kind of like the last picture of that yard. The roundhouse was torn down, and or, uh, majority of it was torn down. It was reduced to about a five-stall roundhouse in 1949. There may be a, somebody you know here. Hayes, King, Hessler. Hessler, right? Yeah? That was your husband? See the third one? Yeah? Thank you for coming. Earlier, I mentioned this particular structure here. These all had a little pot-bellied stove in them, and the, the flagman would keep some wood in during winter. But every train that went past, he had to step out in the middle of the street and stop traffic. That's all been put away now. Uh, by with automatic signals. They still get hit. 1958. This is a Monon passenger engine and passenger livery. The red and white and gray was typically the, pick, the, the passenger livery, but that changed. As time started to run down and people started using trains left, these trains were parked at McDowell Yard. That's an observation car that you see parked in front of us. This is taken from the cab of a locomotive. Here's another coach. Same situation. In the, light, in the late 1960s, they changed the profile of the depot and, and closed in the southern portico to be able to, uh, to keep baggage. And Railway Express was going away at that point. And that's how a lot of packages were delivered. They were the FedEx and UPS of their day. These retired passenger cars are being stored at McDowell, and they're on their way to be scrapped. Now, these cars are really neat because they were actually rebuilt by the Monon. They were originally U.S. Army hospital cars that were completely reshopped, re and new upholstery and new furniture and everything put inside of them. And in 1947, they came out and they were just beautiful. By 10 years later, it was just about on its, on its back. You ought to be able to recognize this picture. Those of us went to Bloomington High School. You got a train crossing 2nd Street. In the background is the gym, and the smokestack over to the right is a power plant. The outdoor basketball court and tennis court, right. This picture is taken almost the opposite direction. Uh, it is the train coming south towards Second Street. Nineteen sixty-two, the thoroughbred is still in its red and white uh, livery, but it the, the changed. They changed to black and gold toward the end of the railroad operations. One of the things I didn't mention that was really important to railroad operations was mail. This was also a railroad post office. Every stop that they would make, they would pick up mail, and they have railroad postal employees in there that would sort the mail and have it ready for a drop-off at the next location. Once again, a passenger coach in black and gold. August 2nd, 1952. I know this day, it was the day my brother was born, but standing on this back of the locomotive is my next door neighbor, Russell Jackson, who was an uh, engineer and later wrote form of vengeance for the Monon. What they're doing back there, it isn't really plainly displayed, is they're frying an egg on the back of the, back of the locomotive. It was so hot that day that they were actually able to cook the egg. 105 degrees, according to Phil Childress. Yeah. 
1956, January 10th, 1956, the railroad that had been called Monon for nearly 100 years was now officially named the Monon. Before it had been any number of different lame names and it had acquired any number of different railroads along the way. But in 1956, it became the Monon. In 1965, the Monon tried to get the uh, tried to get a coal dock established at Michigan City, but the Interstate Commerce Commission turned it down, and the Monon started looking for a merger partner, either the L and N or the Southern. As it turned out, the L and N bought the Monon. This is the last passenger table. It's passed out on the mimeograph sheet. And it basically says, we will not be responsible if you, if you miss the train, because there won't be any more trains. <laughs> this is a yard switcher down at Magnolia Yards. That, that's, that's a good point, Phil. Uh, the trains were heated by steam, and they, uh, they had to have steam generators on the locomotives. So the, there were a few of these RS2 locomotives that had steam generators on them. This is going through town, looking at where the old, round, or the old engine facility used to be. That's what records, Hatchery Becker behind it, looking straight up Morton Street. May of 1968, another one of the RS2s. Okay, and we're coming to the end of this. What happened? Well, the Monon merged with the Louisville and Nashville in 1971. The Louisville and Nashville decided that the Monon was over-maintained, so they started cutting back. With insufficient business to justify the continued use of Michigan City on the Indianapolis line, and they abandoned Michigan City and Indianapolis. And part of the Monon uh, right away in Indianapolis is now called the Monon Trail. And since this was originally produced by Ken Weller, we've developed our own trail here in Bloomington, and it's called what the, uh, the, the, uh, the Beeline Trail, which really doesn't say much for the heritage of the Monon. But uh, now you all know the difference. Here's what happened to the Monon in the end. Sections between Crawfordsville and Bloomington, which actually was north of Gosport, were flooded and abandoned. And to give truth, the Monon track man went in and cribbed that up and had it ready to go. And they were getting ready to bring Phil in to, to bring the rails back up to speed. And a phone call was made from a particular competitor of the Monon, it was later, it was L&N at the time, and said, you don't have to worry about those cars out at General Electric and Bloomington. We'll take care of them for you. So Monon was left to die. And it was abandoned. Anybody know Ron Marquardt? Ron Marquardt was a fireman and engineer on the Monon. He's got two friends there, L. Arnold and B. Cummings. The crews with Monon used to stay over at the Poplar's Hotel in 1969. This is a final picture taken of Ron Marquardt. He's titled this photograph, Once Upon a Time and Wasn't It Grand? Yeah. I'd like to express my thanks to Ron Marquardt and the other members of the Monon Railroad Historical Society for this presentation. Without their help, it wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> Any questions? Mike, can I get the lights? Uh, Yeah. For air conditioning way back when, they would put ice in the top of a car and blow it through with a fan. Is that how it worked?
their ice was put in, put into bunkers uh, along inside the car, and as it uh, cooled, it cooled the car with a fan. George, it's a picture of the depot in Ellettsville. There appears to be outside the depot two signaling devices, I guess. They're circular things with arrows in them, one above the other. What's that all about? Those are train order holders. Uh, and as the train came through, there were uh, as many as three different train orders were given. They were put in a forked-like device with a string attached to the middle of it. And the train order would be tied into that so as the engineer came through, he would hook it, but it turned. So it turned. As you hit one, that wheel turned. The, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that's what they did is they took the hand one and put it in the pipe, and that pipe is what you saw was like this. Any other questions? Go ahead, sir. What was that? Were the trains the cause of the state growing bankrupt? Uh, no, there was a lot of stuff that went on back in the 1840s that had to do with the macadam roads and the canals, and they were trying to find the best way to be able to stand a transportation method. Uh, so I don't really have knowledge about whether the railroads ran the state bankrupt or not. Thank you. What was the function of a roundhouse? Well, locomotive, steam locomotives tended to work well going in one direction. So in order to be able to get them to go the other direction, you put them on a turntable and turn them around. Any other questions? Oh, uh, if you care to look, we've got a display of things up front. Somebody said something? Okay, now. Oh, hello. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Now a word from our sponsor. For those of you who would like to become a member of the Monon Railroad Society today, have I got a deal for you. Once again, two years for the price of one. Come right here, pick up your brochure. We'll be glad to take care of you. Thank you.